uh, a video and and I talk about the announcement for the QGIS project uh, for which I work in the past few months with my mentors that are really thanks that are listed here and that are Martin Dobias and Peter Petri Patrick. So uh, I will uh, uh, touch the following points and uh, I will um, at, at the end of this presentation I will um, open QGIS and uh, offer a little demonstration of how the feature that I've developed the work and how it can be used. This uh, in the photo, by, by the way, it's me, of course. So, uh, before, uh, yeah, before diving in the more technical part and describing the new feature that I developed uh, for the QGIS, QGIS project, I want to mention that this period has been really challenging for me, but I had the opportunity to learn uh, a lot of stuff and to work with experienced and good developers as mentors uh, and uh, to get in touch with the QGIS and OSGEO community and uh, it was amazing. Um, some of the stuff with which I worked uh, are listed in here. So QGIS is mostly written in C++ and partly in Python uh, with the help of the Qt framework and it is a desktop application used to perform analysis in the GIS field. So, for my GSOC, uh, I had to improve my Git and GitHub workflow and I work on the raster calculator that is um, uh, an analysis tool that is uh, available in QGIS and uh, allows the, the user to perform calculation on the basis of existing raster pixel values. So, for example, if I have two single band raster layer in QGIS and I want to have an output, uh, an output layer which pixels are, uh, let's say, the sum of the two initial um, rasters, I can use this raster calculator. So, uh, before this, um, this work, so before my GSOC, it was possible to use the raster calculator, but the output was written on a file and this can be um, a problem because in a usual workflow when dealing with the raster analysis it is possible to use this, um, this tool, so the raster calculator, multiple times and therefore to have a lot of uh, undesired and intermediate files saved on a disk. And in order to avoid this I start to work on a data provider that was able to perform the computation, so the, um, the task of the raster calculator and to show the result in the QGIS um, application without the need of uh, it in this space. So, uh, uh, concerning my contribution, so concerning the, this feature, uh, is uh, in fact a data provider for raster data and it will be seen in the next version of QGIS, hopefully. And for the user, uh, in the raster calculator dialog is a simple flag with a text style edit uh, um, where you can, if you want, add the name of this, uh, let's say, on the fly computed raster. So, as I mentioned, this feature allows the user to perform the same tasks of the existing raster calculator but without the need of saving a file on the disk. And in this sense, uh, I called it uh, a virtual raster provider. It is possible to take advantage of this functionality also via also by with the Python console in QGIS. And uh, and yes, as we'll see in the final demonstration, the output is a raster layer with all the raster layer properties. And uh, it will if uh, it will be needed in future analysis, it can be itself saved on a disk uh, in a file. Yeah. So uh, since uh, I had some time left, I also improved the existing raster calculator and I added the if function that you see in the um, that you can see in the red rectangle and that allowed the user to write and compute the expression written in the other red rectangle. So it is now possible to write some conditional statement in the, the raster calculator and uh, yes. 
uh, to develop this announcement, uh, I have to work. I had to work with the parser and Alexer written by the original developer of this of this tool. So finally, uh, I also had uh, the time to think about some future improvements of my work, and one possibility is to take advantage of the OpenCL integration for better performances uh, uh, for the feature I've, devel I've developed, of course, uh, since uh, OpenCL is already used uh, by the existing raster calculator. And another possible announcement uh, that concerns more the raster calculator itself and uh, not my, my feature is uh, the possibility of output uh, a raster with multiple bands uh, with the declaration of course of multiple formula since right now the output of the raster calculator is only uh, a one band raster so before uh, say goodbye uh, i would like to um, show you how this uh, new feature um, work in qgis so i will open qgis that is already open I added uh, um, a, la a layer, uh, raster layer from the test data. I can inspect the is a multiple multiple band, so it has nine bands. And uh, yeah, for example, you see that uh, at this point, uh, which coordinates are here? Uh, the value is uh, 127 for band one, etc. So. I can open the raster calculator dialog and I can flag this uh, checkbox so create uh, on the fly raster instead of writing layer to uh, layer to disk and uh, I can choose a name or take uh, a name uh, from the expression so let's say let uh, yeah let's say that we want to auto generate the name from the expression so the expression can be really simple like length set uh, band 1 plus length set band 2 and uh, yeah that's all so this is the output so the first band plus the second band output this and if we inspect uh, the values of this um, new raster that uh, by the way as the name of the formula we can see we, we, we took uh, the sum of uh, band 1 and band 2 so in some point uh, the result will have uh, mm, the yeah the sum of these two values uh, well if i take uh, a, the these exact coordinates but by the way we can see that uh, uh, this value is uh, yeah <laughs> is the sum of band 1 and band 2 and yes I can also uh, show you the um, if function that you can see here so there's this button if and um, I can uh, write an expression like uh, length set uh, length set band 1 is greater than 126 I will explain as a so, what does this mean? I will inspect uh, every pixel of the first band and uh, if uh, the single pixel of the band is greater than 136, uh, the raster, uh, the output uh, raster pixel will be 100. In other way, in other case, it will be 10. I'll uh, use the raster um, calculator uh, as uh, it was used before my GSOC, so saving a uh, uh, file, so test raster, and I will press save. So now it is possible to perform the, cal the computation, and uh, I will uh, mm, add another layer on the top of QGIS. And we can see now that I have uh, um, a raster layer with two values. So 110, and if I inspect uh, this uh, raster, some, in some place the, it, it will be 10, and in some other place it will be 100. So, uh, okay, I finished my presentation. Uh, 
I really thank you for your time and I hope uh, this, um, this feature will be used by QGIS, uh, QGIS user and I hope to mm, remain in this amazing community for a long time and to develop some other feature. Thank you for your time. So, thanks a lot Francesco. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Luca. Really good job. And um, there is no question that, uh, from Venulas, but I have one. It's yeah. your work already in QJS uh, source code? Uh, yes. Did you do, did you do a pull request and it was uh, accepted? Yes, yes, it was accepted. Uh, in fact, I've done uh, um, more than one uh, pull request. So they were all accepted. So one for the main feature and the second for the conditional statement for the raster calculator. And I think then that uh, in QJS uh, uh, 3.22, it will be yeah possible to use uh, uh, this, uh, this tool. OK, good. Thanks a lot. And yeah. uh, so apply again for Google <laughs> Summer of Code if you can uh, next year. Yeah, I, I won't be a student, but uh, I will try to, to do something anyway. <laughs> OK, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. So now we have uh, another video and uh, is uh, related to PostJS project and uh, the student will be not uh, online also for the question. So we will see the video and uh, after that uh, there will be another one. Hello everyone, I am Han Wang from Peking University. It is my pleasure to present my GSOC work with PostGIS here. First, thanks to my mentors and the community for the help. My project name is Implement Sorting Methods for the PostGIS Data Types before building GIST Index, and the contents are as follows. The first is preliminaries. Here are the basic concepts of GIST. The GIST, as known as Generalized Search Tree, is a generalization data structure of the variety of disk-based height balance search trees and it is essentially a balanced tree of variable fan out between km and m. Its non-leaf nodes and leaf nodes consists of a predicate p and a pointer ptr to the tuples. In the non-leaf node, p is true when instantiated with the values of any tuple reachable from ptr, and in the leaf node, p is true when instantiated with values from the indicated tuple. We should know that GIST is a high-level abstract definition with these key three methods implemented. It will become some actual index data structure. As you can see, P is for a predicate, Q is for a query predicate, and E is an entry, P is a set of entries. The most important key methods are consistent union penalty and peak split. Consistent return false if P intersects with Q can be guaranteed unsatisfiable. The union returns some predicate R that holds for all tuples stored, and the penalty returns a domain-specific penalty for inserting E2 into the subtree rooted at E1, and the peak split given a set of P of M plus 1 entries splits P into two sets of entries P1 and P2. And there are two important tree methods are search and insert. Search search all the tuples that satisfy Q from root R, and the insert returns new gist resulting from insert of E at level L from root R. The gist can be implemented as B tree, B plus tree, R tree, HB tree, RD tree, and etc. So we can say that we'll, with the well-defined consistent and penalty functions, we can specific a new structure to index our own data type. That's very important in multi-dimensional geometry cases. And the next is implementation. In Postgres 14 and later, there are two major GIST index building strategies. The first is to start with an empty index and insert all tuples one by one. And the second is sort all input tuples, pack them into GIST leaf pages in the sorted order, and create downlinks and internal pages as we go. This builds the index from the bottom up, similar to how B-Tree index build, with sort support API provided by PostScircle. From the description above, 
we can say it is obvious that we have to define an order for the tuples to sort them in advance. In PostGIS, it stores geometry data types as box to df structure, which remember only the bounding box of geometries instead of all the details of it. For instance, two-dimensional geometry uses operator class like kist geometry ops 2 d to build kist index. In the circular file, it is necessary to declaration a sort support function signature like geometry gets a sort support 2D with function number 11 to bind with the function definition in the C file which named like gserialized keys sort support 2D. And in the C definition, geometries work as a gserialized structure, but in the index, as we mentioned before, they are stored as a box DF structure. As you can see, if we want to activate the pre-sort index building method, we have to define a sort support function like this. We should provide attributes function comparator, a brief converter, a brief bot, and a brief for comparator to the sort support structure we get from the database system. The most important function here is hash a brief convert. It converts a data type besides box DF or other into a 32 or 64 bit hash code and the order of the hash code indicates the order of the geometry in the page. With the user defined order, we can compare data types and sort them, pack them into pages which is faster than create an empty tree and insert elements one by one into it. In this case, we apply the center point of box DF of geometries to generate a 32 or 64 hash code for this tuple with a trick of using the float point number of its location directly for bit-wise computation. We all know that machine pages are one-dimensional arrays in a high level, so it is necessary to transform multi-dimensional geometry into a one-dimensional order. Let's focus on this. There are two major specifying curves here, Morton code or the order and the Helber curve. They can define an order between high-dimensional elements just pass them one by one. They can fill a space with any precision you want. Like the left figure, the z-order curve can be refined as required. What's most important is they maintain the proximity that exists in high dimensions in the one-dimensional case. This, that is to say, objects that are adjacent in two or more dimensions will be adjacent in the order of one-dimension curves. This feature guarantees the specifying curve will work like a special index to make a good special proximity on objects and the approximate leaf node content distribution before building the tree index to accelerate the process. And finally, here is a fast helper implementation with magic bitwise computation from the link below. Given a d multiply n bit number describing the index on the d dimension helper curve of order n. Split the index into n groups ij of d bits each, starting from the most significant bit. Each of these tuples i0 through i n minus 1 describes both an authent to recurse into, determining one bit for the each of the coordinates axis, which will group together as xj of the point on the curve as well as transformation that is to be applied to the next recursion level of the curve. In this equation, where Q is a function mapping d index bits to a north end, t is the function mapping d index bits to an element of the transformation group of the Helber curve, and star is the operator of that group. If Q, T, and star are known for a particular dimension, this yields an open algorithm for mapping offsets on the curve to the corresponding coordinates and vice versa by successfully computing the product of transformations at each recursion level. What's more, almost the operations are implemented in a bitwise way, which makes the method fast enough to satisfy the runtime performance. I did two major tests on this implement. The first is search a small patch in the data area, and the second is traverse the data area with the small patch sequentially, and here is the result. In the first experiment and the second experiment, building time, plan time, buffer hit number, and execution time 
are measured in the tests. From the tests, we can see that no index case spends no time on creating index but suffer a lot in the query process. Gist with ProSort methods spend less time on building index than the default gist, which is one third to one fifth of the default time. But in buffer key number and execution time, which means the query process, the gist with ProSorting method seems to be a little worse than the origin. In fact, these results are within expectation because the dimension reduction in the index building will cause an information loss which can accelerate the building process but may cause penalty in the query process. At last is conclusion. The conclusion is that space filling curve hash function does improve the index building performance, but pre-sort index with hash functions may lead to a query performance loss. And in the next, we will improve the query performance with an optimized hash function that better than the original Hilbert or, Hilbert or the order functions. And we will implement an n-dimensional hash function with this bitwise computation or other magic computation. And that's all. Thanks to my mentors, the community, and the GSOC staffs again. I am going to present my project VRP with volume on the database with VRP routing that I did during the Google Summer of Code 2021 program with PG routing under the OSGA organization. So about myself, I am a final year student at IIT BHU from India. I participated in the Google Summer of Code both last year as well as this year uh, as a student developer for PG routing. You can contact me on this email address. So this is the agenda for today's presentation. I'll start with an introduction to VRP routing, moving on to Vroom, and then I'll explain my contributions and how to use the functions followed by the conclusion. Starting with what is VRP routing? So VRP routing is basically VRP plus PG routing. So we had several VRP category functions in PG routing. We created a separate repository called VRP routing, extracting those functions. It's like solving VRP problems over Postgres. These are the available functions in VRP routing. Solving the pickup and delivery problems, solving the problem with one depot and many more. And these are the three functions that I added during the Google Summer of Code program. So first moving on to VRP and Room. So VRP are the vehicle routing problems. So they are the NP hard problems, meaning that the required solution time increases exponentially with size. These are the app optimization problems so given some vehicles, uh, some depot, jobs, uh, the uh, task of VRP is to find an optimal route for the vehicles, satisfying any constraints that we give to it, such as the time window constraint, capacity constraints, etc. Moving on to Broom. Broom is an open source optimization engine written in C++ and it provides very good solutions to the vehicle routing problems, such as uh, these problems like pickup and delivery problems, VRP with time windows, capacitated VRP problems, or any mix of these problems. So we give uh, input JSON to Vroom containing our problems, Vroom solves it, and gives back a JSON containing the solution to our problem. Let's move on to my contributions. So I added the code, the documentation with the doc queries and the PG tab test for the three room category functions corresponding to the use cases of the user. So basically I ported the room functionality to VRP routing. So these are the three functions that I created. We will uh, look into them in the later part of the slide. 
through uh, the benefits to the community. It is always easier to move, uh, work with databases than with JSON. So one can easily update or store the data and route over it on the database. And that is uh, quite easy as compared to creating a JSON, modifying it and uh, working with it. Also, we wanted some standard library for solving the VRP problems, similar to how the PG routing used boost. And that was made available through these functions that I created. Through this, the Vroom users will also increase and it will be easier to track the bugs and the issues. So therefore, it is definitely a benefit to the community. Well, let's move on to how to use the functions. So first, uh, looking at the terminologies. So there are two types of tasks, the jobs and the shipment. So jobs are the single location pickup and or delivery tasks. So uh, say these are uh, the three kind of jobs that are possible. They need to be a single location and it is either a delivery. In that case, the depot will be the put up and the job will be the delivery location. So the job can be a, only a pickup job. So it needs to be delivered to the depot and it can be both pickup and delivery job at the same location. And then we have shipment. Shipments are the same route pickup and delivery task. So it must have a pickup and a delivery and it can be at the same location or different location also. And these are some of the properties of these jobs. They can have service time, amount, skills, priority or time windows. Then we have the vehicles. Vehicles are any resources that uh, either pick up or deliver the task. So they can have uh, other constraints like capacity, skills, time windows, speed factor and so on. Lastly, we have the time matrix that is travel time between all the locations. So say we have the four location and these uh, values represent the time to travel from uh, location ID six to location ID eight. So we can form a time matrix with it. So now uh, looking at the functions, these are the three functions that I created. So all the arguments are uh, in the form of a text. So say this is the function we are room. We can pass the jobs SQL, the jobs time windows SQL, and then shipments SQL, shipments time windows SQL, the vehicles SQL, uh, the breaks of the vehicles, and the matrix SQL. And it will return these uh, sequence approach that is the solution to the problem. Similarly, we have uh, this function for only the jobs and this one for only shipments. Now let's solve a sample garbage collection problem using the functions that I created. Consider this is the dump site where the two vehicles start and end their journey. Each vehicle can hold up to 50 kgs of garbage. They need to pick up the garbage from these three locations. Also, these are the distances uh, time taken for traveling. And each shipment has a service time of five minutes as well as a time window. So uh, these are the shipments that we create. We need to pick up the shipment from here and deliver it to the dump site. So we create these shipments with their ID, with location, the service time uh, and so on. Similarly, we create the time windows for the shipment and this time window can contain time in any quantity, say uh, in seconds or minutes and you can choose a ba base time uh, considered as zero if you wish or you can use the absolute time. So then these are the vehicles. So we create the two vehicles with the start index, the index index as the same, the capacity and the time windows. And lastly, we create the matrix. So these are the four coordinates. So we create the matrix of the four coordinates containing the uh, cost to travel. Then we execute the SQL query, select star from room shipments, and we pass all these uh, parameters the shipments, the vehicles, the time windows, the metrics. And then we give it to the room. So the data that we passed in the SQL query goes to room, room solves it, and it returns back the data to the user. So these are the two vehicles, and these are the steps, uh, like whether it is a start or an end or pickup or delivery. Uh, these are the ID of the task. Uh, and then we have several times like arrival time, the travel time, the service time, uh, waiting time or any load. 
so let's look at the visualization of the result so this is the final result that we get the blue colored vehicle starts at 10 a.m at 10 30 it reaches this uh, point with coordinate 3 this takes 5 minutes and then it goes to coordinate 8 at 10 54 it pick up it and then goes back to the dump site similarly the red vehicle starts here uh, after 17 minutes it reaches here it spends 5 minutes to pick up this and then it goes back to the dump site so basically this is the visual representation of the result that we get here that was all that i did let's end with a future scope of the work so we can basically use these functions and create specific functions based on different use cases of the user uh, there can be many other scopes in the future based on any use case that's all from my side uh, it's an open source project you can look at the code here if you want to contribute or you can even start the repository if you find it helpful uh, for more information, you can refer these links uh, for the website, for the GitHub uh, repository or the documentation. If you want to have a specific look at the function, if you want to develop, you can look at the developer's documentation. And this is the repository for phone. Also, uh, for any further help, you can reach out to me at this email address. Thank you. So thanks a lot, uh, Ashish. Thanks, everyone. He, so he's a student from uh, IT the Bhu Varanasi, India. And thanks a lot for your work. Can uh, Do you think to apply again for uh, GSOC in the future? Uh, well, I can't apply. Uh, actually, we are allowed to participate only twice. And I participated last year as well as this year. Ah, OK, so, OK. It has so you can move to mentor yeah sure okay I'm looking good. Forward to it. perfect so thanks a lot for your work and uh, mm -hmm. see you around okay. next one is uh, venit kumar student of nsec uh, at kolkata india and uh, he is going to present uh, is work. Please, can you share your uh, screen? Wait, do you have any yeah, problem? Yeah, yeah. Okay. One second, one. Benit, I cannot hear you anymore. Hmm. Oh, there is uh, some problem. So I'll remove this one. Okay, so there was a problem before. And okay, yeah. now is I can see. Now? Yeah, now it's visible. Thanks a lot. So oh, okay. the yeah. you can start to okay take a while. Okay. Hi everyone. Today I'm going to present my project uh, uh, named Implement Edge Coloring Algorithm for TG Routing by the Boost Graph Library uh, that I did during the Google Summer of Code 2021 with PG Routing under OSGO organization. First of all, I want to thank my mentors because without them, uh, it wouldn't be possible to complete the project on time. Uh, uh, next. Uh, little bit, little bit about me. Um, I mean, wait. Sorry, we cannot see the slides. It's a black. Uh, we see a black screen. It seems that is loading. You can see the slides. 
Yeah. Uh, try to share the entire uh, Windows, not only the or the entire screen, not only the Windows. Is it visible now? Yeah, now it's visible. Okay, now it's perfect. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, uh, so a little bit about me. I'm Vinit Kumar. Currently, I'm pursuing my Bachelor's of Technology in Computer Science and Engineering from Netai Shubhas Engineering College, Kolkata, India. Uh, I have participated this year in Google Summer of Code under PG routing as a student developer. And moving further, uh, this is my today's agenda. Uh, I, we, I will talk about my contribution uh, about uh, the project uh, uses and application, about its future scope, and finally the conclusion part. So moving on. Yeah. So this is my contribution. I have added is coloring algorithm by the Boost Graph Library to PG routing. Uh, I have created a function PGR edge coloring, which is used to perform query out of the graph data provided. We'll be talk, talking about this in detail in the moving forward in the upcoming slides. I have added uh, documentation, doc queries, and uh, tested my code with a PG tab unit test. Yeah, uh, talking about the benefits to a community. Uh, the function I, uh, I have added, it add the mood functionality to PG routing. Uh, it can be uh, like it, it helps uh, other developer to integrate it with other routing algorithms. Uh, uh, apart from that, it checks whether a graph is bipartite or not. And the condition for that is uh, if the number of color used to color the edges is equal to the degree of the graph, then it's bipartite. Uh, otherwise, it's not. Uh, uh, talking about its application. Uh, it has application in tracking signaling, as you can see in the image, images. Now you talk about, we will talk about uh, its uses. How can a user use it and its application? So sure. uh, uh, we will talk about the algorithm in detail. What it does, what it does is it assigns color to every edge of the graph uh, such that no two adjacent edges have the same color. It is applicable uh, only on the undirected and loop free graph. Uh, otherwise, if, if you perform the query on other graph, like if it's not undirected, it uh, will give a message that the given graph is uh, not edge colorable or so. Uh, it has many real world applications, such as in traffic signaling, in fiber optic, com fiber optic communication, uh, in scheduling problem like uh, processor scheduling, etc. Uh, talking about its time complexity, time complexity, it's e into b, uh, where is the number of edges in the graph, and b is the number of vertices in the graph. Uh, yeah, uh, how anyone can uh, 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 perform query out of it, like uh, uh, like a query out of it. So we create a table like this, having. Uh, uh, parameters like this id source target cost we will uh, make uh, make graph uh, with this property and insert the data into the table according to uh, according to the parameters we have uh, uh, passed and we here we have taken like we can see insert you, you can see here insert part uh, we have taken a graph with 12 edges as an example you can see moving on Yeah, here is a, a 2D format of graph. You can see uh, what it looks like if you draw it on a plain paper or something. Uh, it looks like this. And uh, we what we did is we assigned color to, uh, we assigned a particular is number to every edges, to each edges of the graph, and then apply the algorithm on it. And the algorithm, uh, after applying the algorithm, the algorithm will return color of each edges what color each edges have got. Uh, we are using a number to re represent color. Like uh, 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 we can say anything like uh, uh, color one is blue, color two is uh, 
pink or something uh, we are using number to uh, denote the colors moving on uh, as you can see uh, the, uh, the vertex and two and two and in the parenthesis there is color two is the is number and the five is the color number like the is two is colored with color number five uh coloring you start with col color number one like the first color we choose is uh, number one uh now we will perform the query using pgr is coloring and that we have uh, uh, made earlier uh which returns is id and colored id of the graph uh we can see here we can see here uh the is id and their corresponding colored id in each row like uh, is one is colored with uh, uh, h1 is colored with uh, colored one is two is color with five and so on uh, there are 12 edges 12 edges in the graph earlier you can see uh, here 12 edges so we uh, there at uh, all the edges are colored with uh, their particular color moving on yeah future scope what should be the future scope of my project uh, so Uh, more function can be impl implemented for different use cases like uh, for coloring the distributed graph what distri distributed graph is uh, it is a graph uh, where the data is not on one system it is distributed distributed over more than one system so we can uh, use that algorithm in future uh, and uh, also for parallel uh, uh, for also we can use uh, also we can import uh, some parallel algorithm for pg routing uh, which helps in computation over large scale graph efficiency mm, so moving on uh, okay so this is the detail about my project uh, i i will share the link later after my uh, uh, speech finishes you can see that uh, this is source code uh, documentation and the wiki page about my project you can uh, uh, visit this for more details uh yeah uh, here is uh, uh, pg routing uh, you can uh, explore it and contribute to it uh, you will i am sure you will enjoy, enjoy it because uh, during this google summer of code i have enjoyed a lot contributing uh, to this uh, project pg routing project because uh, mentor are very awesome and they helped me at every step and they solved me all all my silly mistakes and all uh yeah more about pg routing uh, i will share the link after the speech uh, you can visit and explore uh, uh or you can connect me on this email id uh, that's all for today thanks thanks a lot venit really good project and uh, do you think to apply again for uh, gsoc yeah 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 Uh, yeah. this was our first time and i will be a student in 2022 as well so i will looking forward to it good again with the pg routing yeah 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 pg routing yeah okay good so see you around okay Bye. thank you so the next speaker is uh, haryan ken chapagal gol i hope yeah. that uh, i Uh, tell it correctly is uh, from pune uh, university from india and uh, is going to present his work on uh, map mint right right okay cool is the screen visible yes Can you start in uh, presentation mode? Sure, sure. Is it okay, visible? perfect. Yeah, perfect. The scene right. is for you. Yeah, thank you. So, hello everyone. Uh, I am Aryan Kenshapgor. Currently, I am a third year computer and science engineering undergraduate from International Institute of Information Technology. Uh, Pune, India. My proposal to implement 3D scene visualization support to MapMint was accepted to Google Summer of Code this year by OSGO organization. 
so today we'll be having a look about uh, about the project details including an uh, overview about uh, mapment and zoo project along with the technology stacks involved in the same so a few details about the formats and their appropriate terms wherever necessary uh, will be given details so this will be followed by getting to know about the cheetah templating system and preparing necessary documentations involved in the project so mapment is a web based uh, gis system which is designed to process gis data uh, online so in order to make use of this uh, special information in an efficient and flexible way the sdi infrastructure uh, geographic data metadata tools and the users are connected through a framework in an interactive manner so talking about the dashboard of the mapment so so it consists of three major sections so overview with or oh, users and uh, the set uh, the distiller so talking about mapment so that so the overview sec overview is the section which is visible content in the page load users uh, up talking about the user management so users allow the management it allows uh, to uh, see various functions present in the dashboard and to access uh, various uh, data data present in the data store then para we have parameter that allows the management of application settings then speaking about the functionalities uh, it allows various tasks uh, related to the implementation of sdi from modular and user friendly administration interface so talk about the features we have uh, it the mapment instance allows to uh, import and store the raster uh, and raster the gis data compose and save maps in the form of projects and uh, you know configure and run a cartographic portal so when we speak about the special data so mapment processes various uh, various types of uh, gis formats it converts and queries the vector and raster data as uh, explained in the previous slide earlier then one more thing uh, i would like to talk about is the client side is uh, one one part of the client side uh, is that the users experience the interface built with uh, bootstrap html and css which we see here in the mapment dashboard moving towards the zoo project it is a developer community for mapment now talking about the tech stack involved in the project we have uh, uh, 3js so to in uh, 3js to generate and render 3d scenes so 3js obviously as the name suggests is built on uh, javascript it is a multi purpose cross browser uh, 3d library for rendering models so basically users obtain dynamic visualizations of models of different file formats uh, which we'll see in the uh, upcoming slides in details so the sub so basically as the scenes are dynamic in nature so a map so a, so the ins a docker instance or a dynamic live or a live server would be beneficial for the suitable purpose next step we have uh, the cgm library uh, of whose a generated template code is involved in rendering various files of formats such as uh, 3d tiles czml kml geojson and so on so again C cgm is uh, an open source cr cross platform tool for uh, developing various 3d geo special applications which we used in the project for uh, a template code so within a few lines of code uh, cgm generates a globe along with beautiful terrain and imagery as per uh, our choices we can make changes in the code then one more feature uh, mentioned in men uh, to be mentioned here about cgm is the rest api which uh, focuses on conversion of different data types into 3d tiles which is uh, supported by cgm and uh, using this we uh, can add that data in the asset dashboard of cgm to obtain the visualization so now talking about the data formats uh, involved in this we have uh, classified we can classify them basically into vector raster tabular data and documents we have different types such as 3d tiles gltf format imagery uh, quantized, quantized mesh czml kml and so on so 
So these uh, talking about these data types involved dealt by CGM uh, as the back end of the project for implementing 3D visualizations. So these can be seen on the screen or a web on the web browser. So every data set has a different extension, which is indeed which indeed determines uh, the quality of and the data points involved in the same, along with the time taken to render such data uh, for dynamic visualizations. It sounds cool, and uh, yeah. So that was about uh, the back end part. We have uh, involved along with so that was about the back end part involved along with the zoo services uh, to create the functionalities. So we have Cheetah templating system, which is uh, somewhat similar to similar with uh, with a few mo modifications, uh, like adding hashtags before keywords. So again, Cheetah is an open source uh, uh, template and a code generation tool written in Python. So Cheetah can be used uh, with itself or can be involved with other programming languages like JavaScript, uh, CSS, HTML, and so on. So talking about uh, uh, the loaders which are used for rendering the uh, models uh, are taken from 3JS. So the most famous ones uh, involved are uh, GLDF loaders, point, cl point cloud loaders, and OBJ loaders along with MTL. So MTL is basically one more format which is uh, generally used with OBJ for adding quantized mesh and uh, more uh, detailing to the models. Then uh, again, for uh, Again, a loader, not exactly a loader, but a generalized CGM template is uh, can be a suitable option because we have a globe involved and the user experience involved for the same is uh, quite better than 3JS uh, considering the globe part. So yeah, so this so that was about the uh, backend uh, technologies involved in the project. So we have uh, one more part which comes in which which is a which is an important part in, in the software development process is uh, writing documentations about the work uh, and technologies involved, right? So, and one thing, uh, so the documentations involved about the work done, about uh, suppose setting up the environments, development environments, installing uh, specific modules, setting up, uh, or maybe, you know, uh, how does this, this technology work and so on. So one more thing I really liked about, I would like to add into the presentation is uh, the weekly reports uh, culture, which we followed uh, during the uh, coding period was very much beneficial uh, as a student because this involved in adding, uh, keeping ourselves uh, punctual every time. And uh, we had discussions regarding mentors about the documentation with mentors regarding the documentations and about project related tools, whether to use which two tools. So whether it was uh, a specific library for Python or whether it was about creating uh, services, uh, WPS, WMS, WFS. So that was about uh, documentations reports and uh, technologies involved in uh, back end and front end. So I would like to. Uh, Acknowledge my mentors for giving me an opportunity to uh, contribute to the project. So, and also to OSG organization, the community members, and my friends for being supportive and kind throughout the journey. So, yeah, that's that. And more information as as everything you're involved uh, in the mapment in the in, in mapment or. Uh, uh, 3JS, CGM, all these uh, tools are open source, and we can just you can just have a look about uh, those tools and technologies from here. The links are over here. So that's that. And uh, thank you so much for um, uh, giving me the opportunity to have a speech here at fos 4 That's really cool. So thank you. And I'd be happy to share any uh, answer any questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Aryan. The interesting presentation. It's uh, your first time at uh, GSOC? Yeah, it was my first time. And uh, what do you think? You will apply again uh, with the same uh, yeah. project or some different project? So I'll con I'll I'm pla I'm, I'll continue contributing to this one, and I will uh, look out for different uh, repositories too because open source is uh, good. I mean, it's really amazing. Okay, good. Thanks a lot. Thank and you. And see you around. Thank you. Thank you. The next student is uh, Anik Giri 
from India's uh, Institute of Technology, Bombay. And uh, he also is going to present uh, a project uh, with the Map Mint. So, hi, I'm Niket and uh, the... Can you share, can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Can you, I oh, know, sorry, yeah, this one. Can you put on, uh, okay, slide mode? Okay, it? yeah, perfect. So, enjoy the speech. Okay, so I'll start. Hello to all the community members present. Hello to all the community, community members present or here. Myself, Aniket. First of all, I would like to thank for providing me this opportunity for presenting my work, which I have accomplished during my two months period during my GSOC period. So, I would like to start with my project title, which is Implemented 3D Scene Visualization Support Using CZM and Integrate with MapMint. First of all, I would like to describe about myself. I am a grad student in Geoinformatics at the CSRE in IIT Bombay. I have done my BTEC from BTEC in Computer Science and currently I am a member of MacMin community. So the content which I will be covering during the course of this presentations are, not, are introductions. How was the MacMin before GSOC 2021? And what are the updates that I have implemented in MacMin during GSOC 2021? And also I would like to share my experience working with the community and what, the, what are the future opportunities that can be implemented in the project in the updates that I have implemented during GSOC 2021. So I would like to start my introduction with the MapMint. As we all know, MapMint is a geographical information system, which is which is software running on a web server. It is made to provide the to provide the software publishing, cartographic portals, and dynamic applications. It also provides numeric GIS capabilities and also let the users accomplish the various tasks such as import and store GIS data, both vector as well as raster data, configure and generate WGIS applications, as well as configure and use GIS portals as well as access and share maps. So this is this is the general overview page of the MapMint dashboard. As you can see, there are various tabs available in the MapMint dashboard where user can interact with them, where user can where user can upload their own maps and visualize their own maps and provide and provide new new layer, provide new layers in the maps. So so basic idea for this project is which will be benefiting to the community is nothing but with the 3D scene visualization as we all know that it allows us to view data in three dimensions which provides the user a new perspective. For example, as we can see instead of people, instead of inferring a, a valley's presence from the configuration of contour lines the, with the but with the help of 3D scene visualization user can see the valley and perceive the difference in the height between the floor valley floor and the ridge. So we can see that 3D weaving can provide insights that would not be really possible from the same data as georeferenced map. So this is the this is the major application that we can see as compared to the 2D maps and the 3D scene visualizations. So what is the mapment? How was the mapment before this software? So mapment is a complete web mapping platform, as we all know, and has support for various features. So one of the main main, main important part of the mapment is the Zoo project, which is an open web web processing service platform that supports MapMint to run various applications by acting as a software data, software data infrastructure for MapMint. Currently, Ma earlier MapMint is MapMint was capable of processing the georeference imaginary out of the box since there was no feature provided to the user for viewing the data in three dimensions, as we all know, which provides the user a new way of analyzing the data. It provides insight, as we all know that uh, by viewing the three data, it provides insightful details through better visualizations. What are the updates that I have done during or, or implemented during my GSOC 2021 period? So I have implemented a tab in the existing MapMint UI, as you have already seen the tab on MapMint UI, which allows the user to visualize the data, to upload the 3D data from the on their own, and to visualize the data so that they can get in, insights from the uh, 3D data. So this is the tab that I have implemented in the existing MapMint UI. So here, what we what user can do is user can upload their own 3D data. And then they can visualize it with the help of the this with the help of the feature that I have implemented. So currently, I have for the sample I have implemented I have I have already uploaded a scene.gltf file. So this is this is the uh, visualization output of the uh, visual after clicking on the visualization button. This is the output that you will be seeing for the uh, scene.gltf file. So uh, for for weaving, I have I have used the CGM CGM GS API. Which will be useful, which will be an open source JavaScript library, which allows for viewing the 3D scene visualization on the web. So the reason we have used the CGM GS API because as it as as it was as it was performing very good, as it provides uh, precision, uh, visual quality, and it was easy to use. And it also allows it also allows us to visualize and analyze data on high precision WGS 84 globe. 
So I would like to share my experience working with the community. Since it was my first time working with such a huge organization, this this working with such a huge organization helped me to increase help helped me to increase my skills and also provide me a lot of experience about how how an open source community works, how they contribute, how they provide the how they merge the requests, how they pull requests. So it also helped me working with the community. Also taught me about the various open source technologies and the data, how the data is stored, how the open how the three D how the geospatial data is generated, how they are stored. So the future, so the future opportunities that that we can provide with this are generally there are endless possibilities for what we can do with the visualizing the three D data, right? So adding more support based on the requirements of the user, we can add more support which can improve the task of user interaction with the three D data. Presently, I have just implemented the visualization support, but functionalities such as tiling and filtering the three D tiles will allow users to highlight essential features from the data set and also which allow them a better perspective and understand the data better so the i would like to i would like to thank to all all my mentors for providing me such a good good opportunity and helping me during my gsoc period and for, lastly i would also like to thank all the community members for allowing me to be part of such a welcoming and interesting community so for i have provided the links for more information for my, i have uh, i have also provided the link for my github pr presentation also so for this i would like to share my one tutorial which uh, one demo that i have created for my uh, task that i have implemented so this is the tab i have created here when i will click on this tab i will i will upload a single simple image simple gltf object file And when I will be seeing this, when I will be clicking on the visualize button, I will be able to see the 3D data on the CGMGS API that I have implemented on the client side. And and for add-on where and for add-on where we can implement various features on this 3D data where we can select a particular feature on the map, and we can select a particular 3D data on the map so that it will be helpful for the user in the further purpose. So thank you. So thanks a lot, Aniket. Really good job. And uh, how was your experience? It was the first time. Yes, it was my first time. And it was uh, a very good experience for me. Okay, good. And do you think to apply again for the yes, next year? Sure. Yes, sure, sure. For the same project as well. Okay, good. So thanks a lot, and uh, see you around. Thank you, Luca. So the next speaker is uh, Sandeep Saurav. He's uh, from uh, Haiti in Bombay, India, and uh, he's going also to present a project related to MapMeet. Can you share uh, your uh, screen, Sandeep? Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's taking a while. Uh, okay, perfect. So, okay. good evening, world. Good evening, everyone. So, I am Sandeep Saurav. I'm con currently pursuing my MTech from IIT Bombay. And uh, my proposal for this ZSOC is aimed to integrate theory scene builder as a WPS service within MapMint user interface. So this is a brief intro about me as I'm currently pursuing my master's from IIT Bombay and I did my graduation in electronics and communication engineering. This, these are my email IDs and the contact linking uh, sites. So you can contact me. So, so these are the contents that we'll be covering uh, coming to this. So let's talk about my motivation first. So earlier in the math mint, the user can visualize the 2D maps and can even generate or share or more thing and do much more things with the 2D data. But when it comes to visualize the 3D, 3D uh, when it comes to visualize the 3D models and to generate, it fails sometimes. So, so my main purpose was to generate a 3D model, uh, generate a user interface to create a 3D model as well as to visualize it. 
So nowadays, the 3D technology in maps is an explanatory illustration that represents the scale of the real world objects. So with this motivation only, I came up with this idea uh, to incorporate 3D technology in the map mint. So, so these are coming to map mint. So map mint is a GIS software on the internet that is designed to facilitate the development of spatial data uh, infrastructures. And map mint is also for the individuals as well as the organization that wish to manage and optimize the SDI establishment and deploy their dynamic mapping applications. They are the various features and functionality that are supported by the map mint, such that you can import and store the vector and raster data, query the database, publish geographical data in the form of WMS, WFS, and WMTS service. You can edit your data, you can compose and save maps, you can share your data. So these are the various features that are supported by the map mint right now. And this is a brief overview of this architecture map mint architecture that it uses. It uses a service, zoo project, zoo kernel, and various other services and the servers. So what updates that I bring during this GSOC period in the map mint UI. So I created a widget on the map mint UI for users to easily access the 3D point cloud generation service. I created a WPS service to run 3D point cloud generation using the zoo service. And I created some volume to run the services and plomb and generate a point cloud smoothly. So I designed uh, a 3D point cloud generation UI from where the user can directly load the image, run the service. And also you user can also download this point cloud and visualize in some other software if needed. So what are the technologies used over here? So basically when it comes to technology, there are the various technologies that are available. So there were two technologies to generate the point cloud. First one was laser scanner, other one was photogrammetry. And since the laser scanner is expensive and is not readily available to everyone, so we choose another option going with the photogrammetry. And we have implemented our project based on the photogrammetry. One of the technique that comes under the photogrammetry is structure from motion. And it is a method of establishing and estimating the motion of the camera and reconstructing the three-dimensional structure of the photograph scene with the images taken from the multiple viewpoints. And it's a pipeline algorithm with a subtask to process each and every image sequentially. And more specifically, we can call it as a incremental structure from motion because the camera incrementally moves in order. So, so in this, we have used the various types of steps that uh, led to the final generation of this point cloud. So these are the this is a flow chart of what I have implemented. Basically, I have taken some input images, multiple input images. We extracted, I extracted some features, did image matching, estimated camera poses, poses did triangulation points, and then bundle adjustment that leads to final reconstruction of the image. So feature descriptor, there are the various, various feature descriptor available like shift, surf, case, case, ORB, and the disk. And there are some advantages as well as the disadvantages of the both. So I use the shift, surf, case, and ORB and disk feature descriptor in this while implementing this 3D point cloud generation. So coming to feature matching. So matching is the process by which the various features that are while that are generated earlier or that are descriptive earlier matches with the different points in the other images. So, so this is the matching that we did using the ransack. And nowadays the ORB feature is also famously used that uh, both that did both the features of extraction as well as the description as and with the low computational cost. So we use the ransack as well as the ORB and it's depend on the user which one to use. So triangulating the 3D points. So triangulating refers to determining a point in the 3D space and projecting into one or more images into the 3D space. And it is a problem. It is necessary to solve the parameters on the camera projection from 3D to 2D. And the various cameras are involved. And in case of representation, the camera matrices, triangulation is sometimes also referred as reconstruction or intersection because we are using the features from the 2D images and projecting on the 3D space and then we are triangulating or connecting each and every points. So this is the iterative reconstruction or the incremental reconstruction process of the structure from motion. We are moving it, we can move the camera, we are moving a camera, we are generating the features, we are 
we are then projecting the features, triangulating the features in order to generate a 3D model. So this is the point cloud generated from the various multiple images. This is a sample of my work. This is the MapMate user interface after I did my after I did my completed complete GSOC. So this is a brief overview of the dashboard that looks like now. And what are the applications? So there are the various applications that uh, arises and the that uses the 3D point cloud generation. For example, we can use the uh, it can be used in the construction industry for 3D model reconstruction or inspection or or uh, it, it is also used to measure some height and some um, some scales that are used in various measurements. For example, it is also used as building information model. And nowadays, it are they are very and nowadays point clouds are used in 3D 3D game development as well. So. So this is a small presentation of my work. So, so we select some of the files over here that are the image files. So I am selecting 10 images right now. So I am submitting all of them to process and generate the 3D point clouds. So now the point class has been generated successfully. Now I have downloaded the point cloud. Now I'm visualizing it using the mash lab. I've opened the mash lab, uploaded the uh, PLW file that is a point cloud file. Now it is a 3D point cloud that is being generated. I'm adjusting some of to look at it, to view it from the different angles. And this is a point cloud that has been generated with the 10 images only. So you can generate from the multiple images, 50, 100, and thousands. Only the time limit is a, a obstruction over here right now. And I'm currently working on it. So what are the learning experience? So it was a very, very first experience for me to contributing to open source community. I got to learn very, I got to learn so much from this. And uh, time management was uh, a Time management was also an issue, but I somehow did, and I also learned how to manage time between the institutional activities and different works. And I could, did a good job while implementing my GSOC work as well. And it was a very exciting and unique journey for me, and it given a chance. And I would like to further, if given a chance, I would like to further work on this project more. So this, I like to, I would like to acknowledge my mentors, Gerald Pinoy, Rajat Shinde, Venkatesh Raghavan, Sai and Samuel to, for giving me this opportunity, organization OSGO and the development community MapMint, as well the first 4G for showing and presenting my work. This is a link of my project, 3D Scene Builder as a WPS service. You can either go to this link or scan the barcode present over here. So I would like to give a brief demo about one of my friend's project. Uh, he wanted to join us, but due to some health issues, he couldn't join us. So his project was integrating a 3D module to 3D scan a house within a MapMint Android application. So this project allows a minimalist 3D scan, taking multiple pictures, recording camera positions, using the open drone map to rebuild 3D scene. So with the house faces, then load the model in 3D, as well as export the data back to MapMint 3D viewing. This is the bar. This is the link of his project. You can scan the barcode to get to the project of him. And this is a brief overview of the project. What he did in the first phase, second phase, and the third phase. Thank you. I'm open to question now. Sandeep, thanks a lot for your presentation and also to bring uh, the uh, project of your friend that he was not. He cannot be here. And uh, so it was also for you the first time. And yes. uh, I read that uh, you will try again to, to join the community and uh, you would like to uh, contribute more. So uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, there are some work that are left. I would like to finish it. And once it's taken, I would like to finish it all completely. Okay, good. Thanks a lot.
Thank you. So the next speaker is uh, Saurav Singh from the Indian Institute of uh, Information Technology in Nagpur. And uh, he's going also to present a project related to MapMeet. Uh, hi, I'm audible. Yeah, yeah, you are, you are, you are online. And uh, can you share your screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, perfect. No, you close it. Can you open again? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just give me a second. Yeah, sure. Sure. Oh. Uh, okay. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. Fine. Can you move in presentation mode? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, so the stage is for I, you. Hmm. You can start. Okay. Hi everyone. So this is Saur Singh from. Uh, I am a third year undergrad student at uh, Indian Institute of Information Technology, Nagpur, Maharashtra, India. And uh, in this summer, I contributed in Google Summer of Code 2021 in the OSGO organization. And uh, my project was related to the Mapping for ME uh, project. And uh, uh, my project title was Building the AI Draw Major Experience with Unity 3D and integrating it with the present Mapment 4ME app. Okay. So, uh, what is Mapment 4ME? Mapment 4ME means uh, Mapment for Major and Evolution. Mapment 4ME is an Android application for the Mapment web services, basically. And uh, its Android application is built on the top of Jew project. So idea about the project was idea is basically about enhancing the augmented reality experience, which was present in the mapment for ME uh, previous year G-Shock student had did. Uh, in that period, the uh, Android, uh, AR, uh, AR experience was built in the native uh, native Android application and uh, written in Java. So wh when I when I was in search of the projects, I saw uh, that uh, this this AR experience is written in Java. And so the first question that strikes my mind is why why in Java only? Uh, why didn't uh, why isn't any 3D engine like any 3D or uh, you can say Unreal Engine and many other 3D uh, softwares are there are aren't used for uh, for this? So uh, I thought for that I contacted the mentors and uh, uh, briefed them about my idea like uh, uh, converting this pro uh, this project to the Unity uh, uh, into the Unity 3D. And uh, uh, because why Unity 3D, uh, it has more extension to do, more things to play with, more more things to uh, grow uh, grow your project, and uh, more things to add up. So uh, what I did uh, in this period, I did uh, uh, I did a AR draw plus major experience in Unity 3D and add that Unity project as a library to the Mapment 4 me Android project, which was written in Java. So what basically what is AR draw? AR draw it is an AR experience just uh, which just let you draw the simple lines uh, using the line render in 3D space by touching your phone screen. If you are using the uh, using a mobile phone while touching your phone screen, it just let you draw the lines over in the 3D space. And what different we had did in this G in this G Shock project was. Uh, uh, previously, AR draw is uh, known for drawing the uh, drawing the lines in the 3D space only. And uh, what we got the idea from the Mapment for ME app is uh, why not uh, AR draw feature can be used uh, used for drawing the plane plans or uh, building plans uh, like uh, drawing the lines on the uh, horizontal and vertical plane to, uh, to measure the length of the uh, of any object or any other things, or can be used to. Uh, the future of uh, the future idea of, of this was to draw the uh, building plans and share it and store it on the servers and, uh, and share it uh, use it in the future okay so what uh, different we did uh, in this is uh, in ar draw we drawing over the recognized place in the horizontal and vertical planes we first uh, when we launch the ar experience it will just recognize the horizontal and the vertical plane in front uh, in front of a device and you and uh, it will let you draw the lines over the space. And uh, there are multiple features which was uh, which we 
enables uh, for this experience was the uh, one of them was a line width adjuster where you can uh, adjust the line uh, adjust the width of the lines which you want to draw so it can be 0.2 pixel 0.4 pixel according to uh, it it can be re, uh, set according to you and uh, one of them was a video recording while drawing you can record a uh, uh, screen recording in in app uh, while you are drawing the lines in the app and uh, uh, other option is multicolor option when we uh, where we can uh, draw the lines of multiple colors where it, it can be a uh, uh, thousands of a color where we just uh, uh, add up the line drop uh, color dropper uh, in the app and uh, one more thing is uh, we can draw with the multi finger touch ability too we can draw with the uh, not only with the one finger or two finger we can uh, uh, draw with the two fingers and three fingers all these are the capabilities which we added in this project uh, so uh, let me show you uh, the file so this was uh, this was the ux where we, it will uh, recognize the uh, plane and uh, tell you to touch and draw and here if you see where i had drawn one line with a with, like a, on the horizontal surface and it will uh, uh, tell me the length of the line which is a, a very uh, I, i don't think it's possible to see it's a 0.68 meter i have uh, uh, like calculated uh, and checked uh, double checked it and it was somewhat ac uh, accurate uh, kind of 0.02 uh, um, uh, meter difference in the actual actual length and this and uh, i was quite fascinated by this like uh, by the results and uh, if you see uh, right now i have changed the uh, line length 0.6 pixel and uh, the difference between the line width and here is a color dropper feature where uh, we can select the color of the line which we want to draw on the horizontal and vertical spaces and uh, this uh, this video is recorded by uh, by the in app uh, in app uh, video recording features so this was uh, this was the work which i did Uh, in my G-Shock, uh, G-Shock period, summer period, and this project has uh, multiple opportunity in the future to do so, and uh, I and I I I am uh, right now thinking for more ideas for into this project and uh, keep keep in touch with my mentors and trying to uh, get some uh, good ideas and uh, to do uh, to make it more better and more uh, than this. Hi, Sarov. Thanks a lot for your uh, talk. Interesting Hi. presentation. And uh, it was uh, your first time, right, for uh, GSOC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it was uh, my first time. It was a good experience for you. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience for me. Like uh, the weekly reports and the weekly uh, and uh, the re uh, report we did uh, to the mentors and the talk with uh, we did with the mentors are uh, like a uh, very. Uh, It, like it guide us a lot and uh, give us a, a great experience for a software developers if we talk about the software developing environment which we needed to explore uh, needed to know more about is uh, what we, i got from the gshock period this time good do you think to apply next year uh yeah i think so yeah okay good so see you around and uh, mm -hmm. have a nice day thank you have a nice day too So the next speaker it's uh, Kathleen uh, Edrich. Hi Kathleen. She's uh, from uh, North Carolina State University. It's a uh, university that we know quite well since it's a geo for uh, for geo for all lab and there are some people that are uh, also geo charter member and also in the board. So can you share your screen and uh, Thanks to you for your work. I'm uh, I was more because it's a little bit that I'm not uh, developing so much, but I'm part of the grass community, and so I'm really happy to see several grass projects now. Yeah. So uh, this is for you. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, hopefully you can see and uh, hear me all right. Um, my name is Caitlin and yeah, hello from North Carolina, USA. I'm a second year PhD student at NC State University. Um, and this is my first year doing Google Summer of Code. And my project was on improving the integration of Grash GIS and Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so Grash GIS is a GIS software that's been under continuous development since 1982. So it has been around for a while now. Um, and there are lots of ways that you can use Grash GIS. Probably the most common way is through the graphical user interface. You can use it through the command line. There's um, a bridge to QGIS. You can call Grass modules from QGIS. Uh, and you can also script uh, in Grass using Python. Um, and there's even a R API add-on. So there's lots of different ways to use it. Um, and Jupyter Notebooks, we are all, as programmers, probably familiar with, but it's an open source web application that lets you create and share documents that you know, contain live code, equations, allow you to do inline visualizations and narrate your code with Markdown. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we'd want to integrate Grass and Jupyter because Jupyter Notebooks is so popular and such a great communication tool. But there are several things that don't feel super smooth when you go to use Grass in Jupyter Notebooks. The first is that the session handling isn't that great. Uh, there's just a lot of environmental variables that you have to set every time. Um, but the bigger one is that there are really limited rendering options. When you use a GIS software, you would probably expect to uh, visualize your data, to interact with it, zoom, pan, um, you know, toggle between layers. Uh, and right now, the uh, or before my Google Summer of Code project, um, the way that you would view your map was to first like erase any uh, display and then you'd erase any legend file associated with it and then call um, display modules, write it as a PNG image and then display the PNG image in line. Um, and so for my Google Summer of Code project, I wrote a sub package for Grass GIS called Grass Jupyter um, that improves the logic of Grass GIS, but it also, and session handling, but it also provides um, two new rendering classes. Uh, it's currently merged in the main Gra GitHub um, G Grass GIS repository. And so if you install the dev version of Grass, you're also installing Grass Jupyter. Um, and it will be re officially released with um, Grass 8. That'll be an experimental release uh, because development is ongoing and there are lots of areas that uh, we're still working on improving. Um, so the first, the small thing, you can now shorten the launch of grass, of your grass session in Jupyter with gj.init. Um, and then the first class I have for uh, displaying uh, non-interactive renderings is the grass renderer. The grass renderer class uses uh, an API that's very similar to the display library uh, modules. So instead of calling d.rast to, uh, to put a raster on your map, you call d underscore rast. Um, and in addition to being more intuitive, one of the advantages of using this is that you can have multiple renderings going at the same time. So in the uh, previous integration, uh, you had to be very deliberate or like change how you wrote the PNG file if you wanted to have multiple, you know, like start an image, make another rendering, and then go back and modify the first one. But in this case, all the renderings are written to a temporary, unique temporary file. So you can have multiple instances or like multiple um, renderings going at the same time. Okay, and then the second and more exciting and complicated uh, rendering option that I worked on this summer is interactive map. Um, interactive map uses Folium, a leaflet based library for Python. Um, and leaflet or Folium lets you like zoom, pan and toggle between layers. And it also comes with these nice tiled uh, background maps. Um, and as it's written now, you can add rasters, vectors and a layer control option. And you can even export uh, as HTML if you wanted to uh, put your map on a website or share it with others. Uh, interactive map took me the longest because Folium only takes uh, 
data in WGS84 or in uh, WGS84 pseudo Mercator projections. So in order to move things from the current grass map set, which probably has a different projection into Folium, First, we had to create a temporary map set and reproject any data that you add to the map. And then we could export the vector data as a temporary GeoJSON file and import that to Folium. For rasters, they Folium supports PNG overlay images. It doesn't directly support like GeoTIFFs. So we had to provide Folium with the bounds in WGS84 and a PNG image written in the pseudo Mercator. So that requires another temporary map set. So we reproject the raster into a second temporary map set that's in pseudo Mercator. Uh, we can export that as a PNG image and then uh, finally import it into Folium. This took me the longest of the summer to figure out how to do. Um, and then the final thing that uh, we worked on this summer was adding uh, binder support to the main grass repository. So now if you go to the readme on the uh, grass GitHub page, you'll see there's a launch and binder button. Binder is uh, a cloud-based like computing environment that is shareable. So if you click the launch binder button, it will bring you to the latest build of GrassGS operating in the cloud and you can try new functions like or sub packages like grass uh, Jupiter, or if your friend pushed a new module and you want to check it out without installing it on your own computer, you could check it out through Binder. Um, and so there's lots of future work that uh, I'm still working on with grass Jupiter and hope to continue working on. Um, even this fall already, um, my mentor has written grass 3D renderer, which creates images like um, I've shown here. Uh, we're still working on the session handling within it, having it uh, end the session um, without needing to call finish. And then Folium, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's still a lot of room for improvement there, adding options to uh, like click on vectors and access attribute data to access more of the Folium uh, library, do more things besides just simply adding a vector or a raster. And then Grass is known for its time series um, visualizations. So it would be neat to have some time series um, visualization techniques specifically for Jupyter Notebooks. And finally, uh, integration with other libraries like GeoPandas so that you could display your uh, vector attribute uh, as a table or something. So I plan to continue working on that. And I uh, want to thank my mentors and all the program or um, administrators. This was a wonderful experience and I learned so much. Um, a huge call out to my primary mentor um, who spent a lot of time uh, getting me up to speed and teaching me. So thank you all. I'd be happy to take any questions. So thanks a lot, Kathleen. A really good project and a really good improvement for grass. So uh, can you tell us something more about the experience? that you had and uh, if you think to apply again next year and uh, what else? Yeah, I might apply again. I am definitely planning to continue being a part of the Grass Dev community and I'm excited to work more on Grass Jupiter. Um, yeah, my lab group at NC State is involved in grass development, so it fits well with my uh, dissertation work and research. So um, you will be seeing more of me there. <laughs> okay, good. So thanks a lot again, and see you around. See ya. Next speaker is a, again a student for the Grass Genius Project. He is from National University of Singapore, and he is Haron So. His project was to parallelize a, a module for Grass Genius. So please, Haron, can you share your screen? Hey, all right, you I don't see this. I don't, uh, sorry, we can uh, yep. you not do well. Do you have uh, several tab open on the browser? Uh, 
me can you hear me not really can you hear me now not really well sorry Yeah, uh, can you me better now? I can put the, the, the slide, I can see them, but I cannot hear you really well. Uh, do you want to try to switch uh, the browser maybe? Uh, Maybe Aaron, maybe we will switch with Linda that she just arrived, and uh, and we will do later after Linda, okay? So sometimes the connection is not good. Uh, so we will move uh, to the another speaker. She just uh, arrived, and she is Linda Kladivova from uh, University of uh, Prague. Sorry, Linda, if I put you on the stage uh, without any advice before. You are online, so uh, there was some problem with Aaron, and uh, you are ready for the presentation. So just one moment, we will try to get some to get one of the two students back. And uh, OK, so Linda, are you ready now? Yes, I'm ready. OK. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry, but there was some problem with Aaron. And so if, since you are here, we will start with you and after we will move uh, to Aaron. Okay, uh, so, so, um, so I'm in the uh, Kladivova. Uh, yeah, can you share your uh, screen? Oh, please? sorry. Uh, I need to share. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I will. Yeah. Can you yeah. See? Yeah. Perfect. Great. Okay. So um, the stage is for you. Yes. Um, so um, I'm a PhD student from from Prague, uh, from the Czech Technical University, and uh, I would like to tell you something about my Google Summer of Code project called. Uh, first steps towards a new GRASS uh, GIS single window GUI. Uh, so first of all, we will talk about the state of art before Google Summer of Code. Then we uh, mention some project goals, uh, the state of art after Google Summer of Code, and also the next steps uh, for further development. Uh, so, uh, how did it, did it look like uh, before the Google Summer of Code? Um, it looks uh, actually the same still, but uh, uh, I worked on this uh, in the parallel environment and it's not uh, ready uh, so far. But we will talk now uh, about the state of art before. So 
uh, the basic uh, the grass GIS um, has actually two windows. Uh, it's multi window GUI. And uh, the, the first window is the control window, and you then can have additional separate map display windows. The control window uh, contains a notebook with uh, five tabs in a standard 2D uh, map view. It's a uh, data display modules, console, and Python. And you can add also 3D view tab. So it is state uh, in the version uh, 8.0. Uh, uh, so uh, our project goals, um, the first goal and probably the main goal of the, uh, of the project was to do the necessary factoring uh, to prepare grass chairs for a single window GUI. So to uh, make uh, necessary changes in the code in the WX uh, uh, Python code, uh, which is used for GUI. Um, and then uh, the second uh, task or goal was to uh, make a really very simple single window GUI uh, with really very simple base functionality. So the state of art after uh, Google Summer of Code is as follows. Um, we have uh, the single window GUI prototype uh, coded in a parallel script. And it's not merged yet into the uh, development version uh, because we're still waiting for GRASS 8. Uh, and we will then, uh, we need to do this thing and then we will make uh, the uh, thing related to uh, the single window GUI. So uh, I think that, uh, well, it's, it's functioning. Uh, I have some screenshots I will show you. Um, and, but it's, it's not like, um, uh, it has just the simple functionality. So the things uh, that are also, uh, that also works uh, for multi-window GUI, you can, uh, uh, you can expect that it will work also in the single window GUI, but we also want to uh, have some other things. Uh, uh, some uh, special thing that are not uh, in the multi window GUI. So most of the basic functions are functioning. Uh, but to really provide a really uh, user friendly environment, we need to make uh, many other things. Uh, and also, uh, it's not possible to try out the single window mode yet. Uh, but I think it will be uh, possible soon. So uh, here you can see some screenshots. Uh, so it's everything based on dockable paints. Uh, you have uh, those uh, five or six uh, paints, and then there's the center uh, map display notebook. Uh, you can minimize paints, uh, you can move paints, uh, also uh, you can split the notebook into uh, two separate windows or whatever number of uh, map displays you have. Um, yeah, and I think uh, in this um, in this moment, it's very important to say the next steps, the future uh, development, because uh, it will meet uh, very uh, many, many functions. So um, there are some general uh, things um, 
we are planning uh well it's very important thing the first one because we are planning to have the uh multi window GUI uh the inside the single window GUI basically so everyone who is uh used to use uh the multi window GUI uh can make uh, should be able to make it some, somehow from the single window GUI. So the map display notebook uh, tabs uh, will allow uh, user uh, to be undock uh, into the separate window. So then the user could uh, can uh, can move uh, the display. Uh, in, uh, to the second uh, monitor, for example. So uh, it's the first very important thing. And then uh, there are some uh, things uh, related uh, to uh, checking workspaces, or uh, there are also uh, the things uh, about console pane. Um, it's rather the things uh, related to better widget organization or nicer appearance. So for example, you'd like to have a nicer appearance for dark mode because some parts are ugly. And also we need to change the organization of 3D view panel pane uh, and also of the console tab probably. And also there's problem with the status bar, as you can see here. Uh, it's not uh, visible uh, properly, so uh, it's also something uh, needed to be uh, repaired. And uh, yeah, so basically uh, mainly the widget organization and uh, nicer appearance. Then we have one thing uh, which uh, is also very interesting, and it's uh, that the user uh, will be allowed to choose a convenient layout of widgets or to create uh, their, no, uh, their own uh, layout. And it should be possible through the perspectives. So it's something that could be part of a new menu called view. So, uh, well, uh, that's everything now. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. So, Linda, thanks a lot for your presentation and the hard work that you did. Yes, and thank you. This is the second year for you. So you cannot apply yeah. again, if I understood correctly. And uh, yeah, I cannot. <laughs> do you think to became a mentor or something like that? If uh, if, if um, the... I will see, uh, but uh, I'm planning to continue to work on this uh, topic uh, within some uh, my school project, and uh, so. I would like to continue uh, okay, yeah. on single make, window GUI. Makes sense. I, I'm not sure if I would like to be the mentor, <laughs> but probably yes. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure if I'm a good teacher. So. <laughs> uh, you need to help the people to, mm -hmm. uh, to finish their, their work. And uh, so, but yeah, now. Yeah, explain also, also something. Yeah, things. yeah. But now it's better that if you finish your work and uh, it's more, Im more important right now. <laughs> okay. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, I think that there are Thank more questions. You. So uh, now we will try again with, uh, with Aaron. Aaron? Yeah, can you hear me better now? Oh, yeah, perfect now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK, so. So I will share you, and uh, the stage is all for you, please. All right, thanks, Luca. So um, 
My name is Aaron, and I'm a, currently a junior student in National University of Singapore. And my project title is Paralyzing Raster Computation in Grass with the OpenMP Framework. And before we start, I would like to give my thanks to my mentors, Huede, Washek, Maris, and Anna for the guidance, and, and also the OSGO and Grass community for being very welcoming. So first of all, like just a very brief intro, like what are rasters? So rasters are actually just any files that are sort of pixelized and each pixel or like cell contains certain value. And this kind of files, usually we call it rasters. So an image file like PNG is a raster. And raster computation is essentially, we have some input raster map and we sort of have some function f that transform this input raster map into either like some statistics mean median or we output another raster file taking in this input file. And so for example, like one of the module called runiva is like the name suggests is on univariate statistics. It generates some crucial statistics on the input raster files. And also um, for the output type that, for example, we have our neighbors, which gen for each cell in the output file, it actually takes the surrounding neighbor, neighboring cells and sort of take the mean and sampled it to the output new output file. And so GRASS has many, many such modules that does raster computation. And the inspiration for this project is like, um, if you are familiar with Moore's law, essentially what it says is that uh, computational power, uh, which correlates heavily with the number of transistors you can fit on a microchip, it actually doubles every two years. Um, and as you can see, it's a linear graph and on the y-axis is a logarithm on a logarithmic scale. So just fun fact is like just past May, IBM actually claimed that they have managed to make a two nanometer chip. And for context, two nanometer is like the size of a DNA molecule. So yeah, um, but there's a certain limitation on how far we can go by simply reducing the transistor size. So what else can we do to improve the competition? Perhaps you can explore different computational models, which is the current trend right now. For example, the neuromorphic com computing and stuff, or we can explore like different material designs. But the, today we want to talk about parallel programming to speed up the computation. So the framework that we choose is called OpenMP and it's a very lightweight framework to enable parallelism. And the alternative to this are is standard fork join model, which actually create a separate process to do, com to, to do the computation. And a better uh, comparison to OpenMP would be something like a POSIX native library, uh, thread library called pthread. And another framework which is called MPI. But that is more for distributed architectures and it focuses on like communication between computers to uh, segregate the work done. So yes, as you can see on the right, like it's actually quite simple to like paralyze a certain region. For example, if we have some for loop that does some very computation intensive work, uh, just by plugging plugging the one line, the pragma line, you can actually essentially enable parallelism. And on the diagram below, you can see that this is the model on how OpenMP usually work. You have a master thread, and when you enter a parallel region, it creates like multiple threads to run certain work. And also the parallel region, parallel region can be nested as well. So what's the goal of the project? It's really very simple. Like we just simply want to speed up the computation. Imagine like working on a input raster, like 16 billion cells, like it may take up to two plus hours. Essentially, it would be good if you can reduce it to like simply 20 minutes, right? 
I'm sure that's good. But we don't we don't want to do that without sacrificing the correctness of the algorithm. And also we want to maintain the previous behavior. So we still want to keep the memory usage and the this usage in check. So a uh, very sim simple look at how, how the module generally does the computation. Imagine if we have an input raster file of uh, R, col uh, R rows and C columns, R times C, and essentially the workflow is like this. Um, the, ma uh, uh, the, thread, the master thread will actually read some rows into the some buffer in the memory and it will do some computation on this on this buffer and put the result on the output row buffer and after which it will write from the memory to the to the disk and it will repeat this sequence like r times on the other hand there are some modules which completely transfer all the all the the transfer all the input raster into the memory after which it will does the computation and after which it will transfer the result of the computation back to the uh, this as you can see on the right there's some sequential bottleneck in the sense that when we write to the disk if we are writing on the 50th row we need to make sure that the first to the 49th row is actually already written before we can move to the 50th row. And this actually brings some consequences. Basically for the first type, um, it's actually not easy to parallelize because uh, the thread needs to wait for each, other, each other's work to complete before they can move on to pick up the next row. But on the second, on the second type, it's actually very easy to parallelize because we can just parallelize the read section and the computational section and just leave the write section to be sequential, totally sequential. But the key difference is the first type will incur very low memory footprint, like almost ne negligible. But the second type is actually you need to transfer the, like if you have a uncompressed 16 gig raster file, you need about 30 plus gig on memory, which is a lot, right? Most of us probably have 16 gig of memory or RAM. And of course, the last type will be just uh, some statistical output, which is actually quite similar with the first one, which has very low memory footprint, like uh, for the module R Uniwa. So uh, I tried two different attempts, and the first attempt uh, in between for the in between the sequential write, I actually put some sort of a temporary file buffer on the disk, so every thread will write on this temporary file before transferring to the final output map. But the thing with this is that it is very dependent on the user's like disk write speed. For example, if you have HDD uh, versus SSD or NVMe SSD, then the write speed will differ. And also, even though we can have very low memory footprint, there are very high disk overhead. And this, essentially, you need to use up a lot of this space. The second attempt is to split the work done into chunk. For example, on, on the output file, you can see that it's split into like five chunks. And we will essentially open a new parallel region per chunk and allow and essentially increase the output buffer from a row to a chunk and the threads will independently write on this chunk altogether. And after, 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 the, after the buffer is filled, we will write sequentially back to the raster file. And we will repeat this loop for every chunk. And the good thing about this is like we can maintain the previous behavior simply by reducing, like by setting the chunk size as like a row. And and it's very flexible as the users can specify exactly how much RAM they want to allocate for this process. And yeah, so this is our final choice of, of algorithm. And the result is actually quite promising. Like on the left, you can see that uh, 
the R neighbor module, right, with the window size of 15, it takes about uh, two hours and a plus on a 16 billion cells for a single thread run. But uh, if you use about 12, 13 threads, you can actually reduce it down to like 20 minutes, which is good. Um, and what this graph actually tells us like is um, actually by using larger chunk size, it actually doesn't lead to better performance, which makes sense because as long as you allocate reasonably large buffer and there's the overhead of opening new parallel region uh, is kept reasonably low, it won't actually affect performance because the most of the time, most of the work done is actually on the competition. And also like, um, yeah, the performance is very dependent on the competition to IO ratio, like which makes sense as well. So also like, actually it turns out that the first approach and the second approach have very marginal difference in performance, but we still prefer the second approach because the first approach requires extra disk space which is not elegant. So these are all the modules that have been uh, parallelized and will be merged into uh, GRASS on release 8.2. So what's next? We can parallelize more raster modules and more popular one like RMAP Calculate. And we can start working on like 3D raster modules, which is like just slightly more complicated. And also one thing that I didn't mention is that for the statistics, output type modules, right? There are actually some floating point discrepancies uh, because, because the summation order of the floating point is different now that we implemented the parallelization. The output is actually different. Yeah, so this can be solved by implementing some uh, floating point discrepancies reduction algorithm like Kahn summation algorithm. Yeah, uh, I'll be working on this after this, yeah. And thank you for your time and I will open up to any questions and you can check out the project right out here. Yeah, that's all from me. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Really impressive work, what you did. And uh, yeah, I, no question from the audience. And uh, there are some comments that someone is already testing in a real live application and they are really happy. So it's a good uh, answer. It was your first time in uh, Google Summer of Code. Yeah, in fact, it's my first open source project as well. And uh, how was the the feeling and... Uh, yeah. it, it was amazing because like, uh, I get to work with uh, very great mentors and they yeah, give me quite a lot of good advice and I, I've learned a lot. Okay, this is the most important part. Do you think to apply again? Yeah, I, I might consider. I will, but I will definitely continue to contribute to the same project and maybe work on more modules. But I will think to apply next year again. Okay, good. Thanks a lot and uh, see you Thank around. You. So now the speaker of uh, GSOC program are finished. And uh, we have more two to, uh, to speakers that are coming from the UN Challenge. The first one is uh, Patrick Hupp. He's an uh, electric uh, engineering uh, PhD and uh, now is uh, working at the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. Hi, Patrick. Hello, Luca. So, the slides are already there and uh, the stage is uh, all for you. Thank you for this. So, good morning, everyone. Today I will talk about the UN OSG Educational Challenge. That's about the training on satellite data analysis and machine learning with QGIS. So this is a high level presentation, a very quick one. So if you have any question later, you can contact me and so on. So Luca already introduced me, so <laughs> I don't need much more than that. So just say that I also member of the two societies related to remote sensing, the 
ISPRS and the IEEE GRSS. And my main research topics are about image analysis, computer vision, remote sensing, machine learning, deep learning, and cloud computing. So basically the idea of this challenge was that satellite imagery is becoming a trend, especially to generate geospatial information due to many open data sources available nowadays. So the aim was to prepare a tutorial about the functionalities in the QGIS platform and also plugins for processing satellite data. So this is just the title of the tutorial. It's machine learning with Earth observation data, case studies with semantic segmentation and regression. It's basically a hands-on approach based on two exercises that address different applications related to machine learning using satellite data and also the QGIS plugins. So both applications are related to climate change, which I believe are very important topics. And since I'm from Brazil, I also choose problems related to South America. So the tutorial was developed in Sphinx, so it can be easily generated HTML files, PDF files, and so on. And here is some, how it looks. So if you access by a browser, for instance, you can navigate easily through the chapters. It was developed and tested for the current long-term release. At least it was the current long-term release when we started. And it was also tested on different operation systems. And all necessary data is also available on an external repository. So the first exercise is a supervised change detection. And the application that I chose was monitoring the evolution of the snow cap peak of the Huascaran mountain in Peru during the last five years. So the methodology goes from download the image, create the data set. So we have to download, clip, pre-processing, and also collect samples for training. Then we apply cement segmentation, generating a classification map for each date. So in this case, we are using random forest classification, but we could use a different machine learning algorithm for that. And in the end, we also compare the classification maps to create a change detection result. So basically we use two plugins for that. The SCP that have a lot of tools. So it basically uh, enable us to download products like uh, Sentinel data, Landsat data. And we can also um, pre-processing, post-processing, make some reports. So it's a very nice tool. And also the Tsitsaka classification tool that we are using in order to training and perform the classification. So here are some results, a summary that we are calculating and measuring how many pixels that are related to the ice for each year. And here we can also see the image and the generation mac the generated mask for each year so here are some just two examples and how we can do the change detection so the red dots here the red polygons here are when the snow cover are diminishing and the green ones are when snow cover are expanding the second exercise is based on linear regression and the application is monitoring the deforestation trends for São Félix do Xingu in the state of Pará in Brazil during the last four years. So again, we start creating the data set. We are filtered bounds. We also add some bands like NDVI. And then we apply the regression in order to create an NDVI trend. The plugins used here are the GEE time series explorers to make analysis and also the Google Earth Engine and PyQ GIS to work with the, the data and also applying the linear regression. And here are the results of this part. So the producer trend map is on the left and we can also compare with some map, for instance, the one generated by the global forest watch map and actually it's it's better than I was expecting since, since this is a simple example. And the red dots on the maps 
correspond to the deforestation increment. So user will be able to understand and work with some machine learning and satellite data processing tools. So they can be able to download, pre-process, clip, mosaic satellite image. They can create a data set for supervised machine learning, performance segmentation, linear regression, or different machine learning necessities. And also highlight the results, measure, quantify chains from different dates. It will be published soon on the OSGU week site. And just a note, the results that I show you, and they are part of the tutorial, are just preliminary results. So we focus more on how to use the tools than on the accuracy. I would like to thank, to thank the mentors that are Maria Brovelli, Cristina Brinciano, Kung Fan, and Zongzi Chen, and also some contributors that helped me to test the tutorial, like Pedro Diaz and Jorge Paredes. That's it. Thank you for your attention. And if you need something, you can also contact my email. Patrick, thanks a lot for your presentation. And uh, there are no questions from the chat. But I, I have a question. Um, it, it's uh, online, this uh, documentation? Yeah, it will be online soon. It's not yet. Um, the mentors are also, uh, they have to, to check everything. Maybe we have some chains and it will be, be online, I believe, in next month, probably. Okay. Only. And uh, it was a good experience for you? Did you learn something? Did you add some? Uh, yeah, some it's, it was very interesting experience. Um, I already did some workshops and some tutorials, but this was different one i never did one for qgs and it was very nice to see also the plugins i have to learn some of them that were not so into so yeah it was a very nice experience i hope uh, i can collaborate with the community with that uh, another question uh, do you use sphinx because uh, also the uh, qjs documentation is done by sphinx or uh, it was your own uh, cho choice no, no, actually it was something that was already on their plans. Uh, it, actually, it was my first time using Sphinx and I, I thought it was a very nice one too. And it's very easy to use and you can generate a very simple page, for instance, and it's easy to, to change, it's easy to, to maintain. I, I really like to use that. Okay, good. So, thanks a lot. And uh, now there will be the last Okay, thank you, Luca. You're welcome. The la last speaker that is uh, Swapin uh, Yoshi. It's a student of in geoinformatics at uh, Uni the Eat of Bombay in India, and uh, his keen interest uh, is uh, in uh, open source tool GIS and uh, artificial intelligence. He's also part of uh, UN Challenge and uh, he will uh, tell us something more about his project. Hi, Swapil, can you Hello, switch Luca. on? Hi, right. yeah. and can you share your uh, screen, please? Sure. So I hope my presentation is visible. Yeah, it's visible and uh, it's really good. So the stage is for you. Yeah, thank you so much, Luca. So hello everyone, this is Swapnil Joshi and today I will be presenting before you the work I had done in the OSGO UN Committee Educational Challenge 2021. So the title of today's presentation will be Achieving Sustainable Development Goals with PC Routing. So before I start, I would like to give very special thanks to all the mentors uh, that is Vicky, Rajat, Timur and uh, Serena for their continuous guidance and support. So yeah, let us begin with the presentation. So first of all, who am I? So as Luca mentioned, so I'm a grad student in geoinformatics at the Center for Studies in Resources Engineering in IIT Bombay, India. I'm also an urban planner and a member of PG routing community. Recently, I was also winner of OSGO UN Educational Challenge. So that's all about me. Now let's go ahead uh, with the uh, details of the challenge. 
so this challenge was organized by un open gis initiative so we'll understand a, a bit about un and open gis so un stand for united nations and it is an intergovernmental organization which was founded in 1945 that aims to maintain international peace and security and develop friendly relations among the nations to achieve international peace the un open gis initiative aims to identify and develop an open source gis bundle that meets the requirements of the un operations of both peace building and peacekeeping so this workshop is for pg routing and as many of us know pg routing is not only useful for routing vehicles or cars on the roads but it can also be used for several other purposes such as analyzing the river flows uh, analyzing the connectivity of the electricity network etc we'll be delving into more details as we go ahead so in the above context the challenge here was to create workshop material for pg routing with exercises that would help achieve the targets of the un sdgs so what is SDG? So SDG stands for Sustainable Development Goals. So the, the Sustainable Development Goals were envisioned by the United Nations. These are the 17 interconnected goals that were adopted in 2015. This was a universal call to all the nations to take the action to end poverty, hunger, and to protect the planet from overexploitation. The 17 goals are integrated in such a way that they recognize that action in one domain will affect the action in others, will affect the outcomes in others. So the aim of this challenge is to expand PG routing workshop to cover three of the UN sustainable development goals. So the three sustainable development goals here are, first is the third one, good health and well-being. In this sustainable development goal, the exercise which was done was estimation of population served by the hospitals. The second goal was SDG 7, that is affordable and clean energy. And the exercise which was done under this was optimizing the electricity distribution network. And the final one is the SDG 11, that is sustainable cities and communities. And the exercise done here was, is the city getting affected by rain or not? So in this short presentation, we'll be looking at the third exercise. So as we all know that the world is uh, increasingly urbanizing, more than half of the world resides in the cities. So this makes it very important for us to take care of the cities and help the cities when uh, there are disasters. So this sustainable development goal aspires to make the cities inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. There are several targets of this goal out of which the two targets are 11.5 that is reduce the adverse effects of natural disasters and 11 point B that is implement policies for inclusion, resource efficiency and disaster risk. So this exercise will focus on these targets. So the flooding may happen in a city because rain happens at some another place. So the rain may happen at a certain distant point and water may flow through that river or any waterway connecting to the city and the city may get flooded. This makes it very important for the cities to remain alert when there is a chance of disaster like floods or flash floods. The local administration should know if their city is going to get affected by the rains which happened at some other place so that they can raise a flood alert among the citizens. So this problem, I mean this exercise will solve one of such problems. So the problem statement we have at our hand is to determine the area where if it rains, it will the city be affected or not. The core idea behind this is that if it rains in the vicinity of a river which connects the city, then that city is getting affected. So now let's see the methodology which we are going to follow. First, we'll be choosing a city. Second, we'll be getting the data of rivers. Third one would be creating the connected components of the rivers. The fourth one, would be creating a buffer around the city to get the idea of the proximity. The fifth one would, it would be intersecting the city buffers with the river components. And sixth one would be creating a buffer around those river components. So we'll go deeper into each step. First one is choosing a city. So for this step, we are, we are choosing 
the city named Mushiganj from Bangladesh. So why have we chosen this city? So this city has multiple rivers in its proximity, which makes it an apt location to demonstrate this exercise. To define its location, we use PG routing and we use uh, its latitude and longitude to store it as a point in a table. Yeah. The next step is to prepare the data. So to prepare the data, first we had downloaded the uh, data from OSM. We uh, choose the area and we download the data using overpass API or directly using export. After that, we use OSM to PG routing converter, which is a command line tool that inserts the data into the Postgres database. So now once we have the data, now we can go ahead and work, uh, work on these data using PG routing. So this is the visualization of the data we have. But the problem here is that the rivers are made up of multiple edges. So uh, we need to find that each river, uh, we need to find all the edges which belong to a river. So how can we solve this problem? So this problem can be solved by using PGR connected components. So the next step here would be creating river components. And we use PGR connected components, which is a tool uh, which gives the components of an undirected graph using a depth first search based approach. So when we use the tool, so we get the output like this. So the different colors over here signify the corresponding components. So each component may contain multiple edges. Now let's proceed to the next step. So now we have our components as well as our city. So next step would be creating a buffer around the city. So we use the postgis function as the buffer to create a buffer around the city. So to visualize it more clearly. So this is how it will look like in your GIS. So after this, we'll be finding the intersecting rivers uh, in the buffer to take to find the rain zones ultimately. So we use SP intersects with the rivers and the buffer function to get the intersection. So as we can see over here, these three edges or rivers are intersecting with the buffer. Now to get the rain zones, we use SP buffer function, and this is the output. But as you can see, this output seems a bit messed up because as I told earlier, this edge is made up of multiple edges, which is causing these multiple polygons to appear. So what we can do is we can take the union of all those polygons and get a combined rain zone. So we have achieved the objective for this exercise that was to get a rain zone where if it rains, the city will be affected. So if the local administration gets the news that it is raining heavily anywhere over this area, it can raise a flood alert and alarm the citizens to, to stay away from the water banks. Yeah. So that was the end of the exercise. Now I would like to tell some learning experiences which I, which I, uh, which I experienced during this uh, UN educational challenge. First was to contribute to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So contributing to such a big goal, which is uh, which is envisioned globally, was a big pleasure for me. Second was creating workshops with globally reproducible exercises. So just by changing the bounding box or by changing the area, the same exercise can be reproduced for any area. So it can be used by many users. Then solving real world problems using open source tools, of course, and then graph algorithms like Kruskal, Frame, driving distance, etc. Also, the main learning was that PG routing can be used for uh, the, the exercises or the problems other than routing vehicles. So yeah, once again, I would like to thank uh, my mentors and also the OSGO UN community for US UN committee for giving me this opportunity to uh, take part in this challenge. Also, I learned a lot from the a very lively PG routing community, and I would love to be uh, its part in the next challenge also. So thank you, everyone. And you can find the whole work of this uh, UN challenge uh, at this QR code. So just before uh, saying bye-bye, I would like to present uh, the 
the work which i had done in a in a very less time so yeah so this is the website where the work is published and these are the five chapters so we saw the fourth chapter right now so this is the third chapter which talks about estimation of population served by the hospital so this chapter contains detailed exercises which are very nicely explained and which can be done very easily by anyone who knows very basics of pg routing so i'll quickly just show the outputs so here we see this is the hospital and this is the service area or the roads served by the hospital if you see these are this is the generalized service area and ultimately what we are doing is we are uh, estimating the population in each building we are storing it into roads and then we are taking the sum of all these roads population from all these roads and using it as a dependent population for the hospital yeah and the final chapter here is to find is optimizing the electricity network so this is the sample network which i had taken so when the electricity distribution lines are laid it is not laid on every road so the network needs to be optimized to uh, to bring the cost effectiveness so this aligns with the affordable energy goal of the un and when we use a minimum stranger algorithm on the road network it gives us the shortest or the, the the shortest path the optimal path where the electricity network can be laid and which reaches every locality of the city so this will increase the cost effectiveness and which will make the energy affordable so yeah that's all from my side and you can of course find the whole work at this qr code at this website so yeah thank you so much Sapul uh, he disappeared oh i had some question for him i hope that uh, he will uh, join again let's see yeah uh, so the session is finished uh, it was really interesting to see all these uh, young student uh, to work on uh, open source uh, geographical software and also in documentation and uh, i hope that you like this session and uh, i think that it was a really good idea to give the opportunity to the student to present the, their work oh, okay he's back swap it in I'm sorry fine. You remove yourself. Okay, so actually the tab was uh, yeah, there was some no, issue I, with the network. That is why I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, I have a quest, uh, short question. Oh, okay, so yeah, one is coming from the from the audience. How is scalable in this workshop for other areas of study? With respect of to data used for analysis. Yeah, so the data used for this challenge was a sample data which was taken from OSM. So uh, the data can be uh, downloaded by changing the bounding boxes, uh, and also uh, so basically it takes into the OSM files. So you can use any bounding box of your required area, and this can be easily reproduced by following those steps. Okay, and uh, okay, you already answered to one question. So the data are coming from OpenStreetMap. Yeah. And um, did you already know PG routing, or uh, it was the first time that you got in touch with uh, the software? So I had done a small project. It was for routing of emergency vehicles. Okay. In my and my grad studies only, so that uh, I had my introduction to PG routing before. So this was my uh, second kind of project, but a very detailed one. Yeah, we saw a lot of example and uh, command. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there are no other questions, and uh, the session is ended. Thanks a lot, uh, Swapnil, and uh, see you around.
Okay, so uh, I will uh, close the the live session, and uh, there will be a a keynote speak speech now on the Malena Liebman room. See you there.